I want to welcome everybody for taking some time on their Sunday to join us in this very last meeting of 2022, which is something of a momentous meeting for me because this is the, the second year anniversary of my starting this program in November 2020. And we've had uh, some uh, 22 programs since then. And uh, so that's actually quite something. We've covered a very vast uh, arena of gem and gem knowledge in that intervening period and had some of the world's leading experts across the field of gemology join us and educate us. So um, I'm feeling honored and humbled and happy at the same time that we've been able to carry this program that has really no no commercial aspects to it and and we have we're nonpartisan in every way. So, uh, and I'm getting messages which are very enheartening, saying thank you for what you're doing for gemology. And um, so thank you everybody for, for your positivity and your support. Now, just so you know, um, we have two speakers today. I'm going to introduce the first one in a minute. Uh, and, and, uh, we'll, and then when he's finished, we'll have a, a, a small period of uh, question and answer, which I actually hope as this last program of the year that you people will step it up and actually ask some really good questions because it's through questions that we actually expand the level and the amount of education we receive from our experts and so I'm hoping that you'll help us that way. Uh, just sort of interest, I mean the reason that I chose this particular topic, this program, because I'm just, uh, I'm noticing how omnipresent now the mentioning and advertising for synthetic diamonds has become. And, and this is something of interest because synthetic diamonds have been out there for 68 years now. And uh, General Electric in uh, New York were the people who first created um, the, the synthetic diamonds and their project was called Project Super Pressure. And the first fully gem one carat stone, I was told by the engineers, at the project uh, cost them an, as much in power as is produced by Niagara Falls in an entire day. So it is an extremely expensive first effort at making a one carat synthetic diamond. So the first really gem quality synthetic diamond was in 1971. So we've been at this for quite a while and yet it's only really kicking in full gear, I think in the last two years. So I think it's a very topical topic and we've got some very interesting speakers to uh, to help us understand this subject today. So uh, first of all, I want to uh, be as a preemptive comment to say that since we're not going to meet in December this year, I want to wish you all a very happy Christmas and a and a super Christmas season. And of course, those of us who are in the trade, wishing us all a very successful Christmas season because this is probably the most profitable portion of the year outside of um, Valentine's Day, I think. So it's very important for us, especially in the diamond business, uh, to to be able to uh, to have success at this time of year. And we will not be having another program until the end of January, and I'll probably be broadcasting that from uh, from Tucson. Um, just saying. But um, so anyway, get to it. Getting to it. Today's topic is synthetic diamonds, and our first presenter is a gentleman by the name of Duncan Parker. And he's vice president, <laughs> excuse me, of Dupuy Fine Jewelry Auctioneers in Toronto. And he provides an assessment, valuation, consultation, and specialized jewelry and gemological advice to enable a global client base to make informed decisions in the acquisition, disposition, at auction, or of luxury jewels and timepieces. Wow. So he's handling a lot of money every day. He's past president of the Jewelers Vigilance. Uh, of Canada, a National Independent Industry Ethics and Watchdog Organization. He chaired the committee that wrote in collaboration with India Industry Canada, uh, Canada's Jewelry Appraiser Guidelines, and quite frankly, we needed that, and I'm glad to see that, and the guidelines with respect to the sale and marketing of diamonds, pearls, and colored gems. As an educator, he's no slouch. He's past president of the and instructor of the Canadian Gemological Association, of Canada, and he's also written and taught gem and jewelry programs at George Brown College and at the Life Institute at the Toronto Metropolitan University. He's developed and written training programs for staff at several jewelry retail organizations. And he works as a jewelry evaluator and a diamond and color gems, 
card stone specialist for 30 years. He doesn't look old enough to have done that for that long. He's a regular columnist and on appraising antique jewelry and gemological subjects for several journals as a regular speaker at, at, at national, international and national conferences and just recently spoke at the Canadian Gemological Association in Vancouver. So with no further introduction, please welcome and, and please stay muted. I, I like to suggest so it makes it easy for us to hear. Please welcome Duncan Parker. I'll just uh, share my screen here. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Ray. We have uh, uh, two speakers here. Um, I'm honored to have been invited to be part of this. Um, uh, Branco is the uh, is the scientist, and uh, and I just uh, talk about the 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 basic hairy details. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, a little bit of background on the uh, the history of of people trying to make diamonds, uh, and people have been trying to make diamonds forever, uh, which of course is terribly exciting. Uh, diamonds are uh, always uh, have always stood out as something that people want to know more of, they want to understand more about. And, uh, and of course, it's a, uh, it's a mysterious gem. Um, so I have a little, a little uh, scoop here with um, some lab grown diamonds. Now, I, uh, I titled manufactured diamonds past and future. Uh, Bronco is going to be sort of talking about current things, I guess. I'm, I'm talking about ancient history, up to the time when people people started growing these things as actual diamond and um uh, so I'm, I'm saying from synthetic diamonds to lab grown diamonds and everyone understands that the the, the ling linguistic transition has occurred that there there's no one calling them synthetic diamonds anymore or very very, very few people they're all called lab grown diamonds um see if i can make my screen change to the next screen okay now I'm talking a, a little bit about ancient history. Uh, there was a, uh, a student of Aristotle whose name was Theophrastus, um, and he talked about how uh, some materials, some gems, some minerals could be simulated uh, by melting material and hardening it and mixing other elements, putting copper in with with something as it's as it's uh, as it's grown. So, you know. Uh, 2500 years ago people were trying to work out how they could make a diamond now of course at the time we weren't actually making diamonds um but uh through history we had uh, a lot of people who talked about diamonds um uh avicenna ibn sina uh out of uh, iran uh very very important uh philosopher uh writer researcher, scientist, uh, discussed the fact that people were attempting to um, grow other materials artificially. And he said, as to the claims of alchemists, it must be clearly understood that this is not in their power to bring about any change of species. They can, however, produce excellent imitations. Um, so uh, he was under the impression that, uh, that we couldn't create something new, but we could uh, create something that looked very like what we wanted to create. Um, he was very important and, and uh, explored the whole world uh, in, in so many ways. And I, I'll start by saying uh, I'm skipping Pliny because he talked about uh, diamonds as very important. And it's very important to mention Pliny in any gemological talk. So I've just done it, uh, but we'll skip him otherwise. Um, uh, in 1652, Thomas Nichols, who, who wrote the first book on um, gemstones in English, uh, Lapidary or the History of Precious Stones, with cautions for the undeceiving of all those that deal with precious stones uh, in 1652. Um, this book was largely inspired by uh, the work of Boethius de Boot, and he did a, uh, uh, Nichols did a translation, and this is the first book in, in English. So he says in one of his passages, um, uh, the generous sparkling forth of its glory. He, he, read this book because it's the, the language is so marvelous. Um, the most judicious jewelers distinguished the true diamond from those of bastard kinds. Um, so there were people who were producing things that looked like diamond, but they weren't producing diamond. They had diamond and imitations. Uh, Robert Boyle, uh, very, very important uh, researcher and scientist, one of the founders of the Royal Society uh, in Britain, um, 
was a, uh, a, a true uh, experiment or perhaps an alchemist. An alchemist, we tend to think of an alchemist as someone who, who, who's trying to turn uh, lead into gold. Uh, alchemists in the, the Middle Ages were, were people who basically chemists. Uh, and Robert Boyle in the, in the 17th century was uh, definitely a chemist. And he tried to work out why things grew in certain ways. He would mix elements and try and grow crystals. And then he would put another element in and find that the, the crystal of the material would grow in a different way because it altered its chemistry. And of course, we know now that, you know, the chemistry of a, of a, a, a crystal, a chemistry of a material will, of course, influence the, the way in which it crystallizes. So he re referred to metallic tinctures, and you know, if we we know if we add uh, a rare earth metal or we we add a transition metal, uh, we can alter the color of something or alter its uh, its mineral structure. Uh, petrescent juices. Uh, he felt that most things uh, formed from a from a liquid and uh, petrescent, the turning into stone. Uh, he did a marvelous experimentation. His book is very brief and, and worth looking into. Uh, he uh, experimented. He, uh, most previous scientists reported on findings reported to them by others. Uh, Robert Boyle actually experimented with things. So he took a diamond and uh, heated it uh, sufficiently that it just disappeared and turned into vapor. Uh, he didn't know what the vapor was. He just knew that the diamond therefore could be made to, to change its form into a vapor. Um, in the uh, uh, 18th and 19th centuries, there was a lot of activity in, in actual science, in research, to try and work out what mo many, many, many things were. Uh, and uh, there's a, a book by uh, Du La Fay, uh, published in 1874, and he re re reports on a number of people who were experimenting with diamonds. And uh, Lavoisier uh, experimented with diamonds in a sealed environment and essentially was able to vaporize a diamond and analyze what was left. Uh, so he discovered that uh, what was left after a diamond disappeared was uh, some carbonic acid. Uh, so that vapor that Boyle had discovered was probably carbonic acid. So he, Lavoisier, discovered perhaps a diamond contained carbon. Uh, in 1797, Smith's um, uh did further experimentation, uh, fused a diamond into sodium nitrate, and the diamond was converted into carbon dioxide gas. Uh, he therefore determined that a diamond was pretty much pure carbon. Uh, I have put a note here, all of these experiments uh, are, are probably very interesting to do, uh, but it's best if you're going to do it with a client's diamond, ask them first, uh, but best to do yeah. it at zero. Um, uh, so Du La Fay uh, proposed that gemstones were formed by several different methods. And I have a couple of places where we, we make reference to the formation of, of gemstones. Uh, he said fusion by direct heat. In other words, we melt a material and, and it, it will uh, uh, melt, it'll become liquid and it'll solidify. Uh, dissolution by the aid of foreign substances at various uh, variable temperatures or bringing together in the state of vapor substances destined to become the elements of the stone. This is in 1874, he says this. Uh, much of the synthetic material we see today uh, is formed from these uh, these methods. Uh, of course, the bringing together in the state of vapor is how we're producing most of our uh, diamonds uh, synthetically these days. Um, he reports on Ganal uh, in 1828 who tried to uh, uh, produce crystals where uh, phosphorus uh, and carbon disulfide were combined. Uh, phosphorus absorbed the sulfur, leaving carbon, and it was left for months, and tiny little octahedral crystals formed. Uh, it was felt that this may have been diamond uh, in uh, further analysis. It isn't diamond, but at the time we were working on, you know, is it harder than a piece of glass? Can it scratch glass? Uh, is it an octahedral crystal? Because that's how a lot of diamonds seem to be shaped. Um, but uh, of course, in retrospect nowadays, and with some of these uh, results of these experiments, we, we know that there are still specimens available for sometimes, and we can now test and discover that they're not diamonds. Uh, Dupré, uh, in the mid-1800s, uh, he uh, stated that he felt diamond was produced by some igne igneous means. 
and he used electricity um, to uh, to induce the growth of diamond. Uh, he did produce crystals. They were octahedral. Um, they were absolutely microscopic, and unfortunately, they were also not diamond. Uh, Hane, uh, J. Ballantyne Hane, uh, he did great experimentation. You, you, it would have been interesting to see his experiments, but you would have wanted to stand back. Uh, he had wrought iron tubes filled with organic material. It was heated to red hot for hours. Uh, of 80 of these uh, wrought iron tubes, uh, three of them did not explode. Uh, so 77 of them did explode, which uh, is why I'm saying would have been uh, interesting to have worked in the laboratory either above or below, but uh, perhaps not right in his laboratory. Um, so in the uh, resulting materials that were produced, the, ex the, the, the explosions may have produced diamond through uh, extreme uh, effects, the, the heat and pressure, but uh, he sent nine samples to the British Museum and uh, the um, results are here in a uh, photo from Gems Made by Man by Kurt Nassau, uh, published by GI in 1980. Um, these were identified as diamond. Uh, they're now identified as natural diamond, unfortunately. Uh, Hane was also experimenting with diamond in his laboratory, and, and there was natural diamond present. Um, in 1889, at the Paris Exposition, um, there was the availability of synthetic gem material, not diamond, but synthetic gem material. Um, uh, Frémy uh, was experimenting with the growth or recrystallization, as he called it, of, of ruby. Uh, and if you look at the this anchor, it was purchased at the exposition in 1889. And uh, I, I, I saw this and it was uh, documented and passed down through, through a family and they still still own this thing. And uh, they look very like uh, really quite nice uh, Myanmar uh, rubies, that sort of rich uh, uh, pinky red color, um, slightly sleepy with inclusions, but the inclusions are, are, are microscopic little bubbles in this case, as opposed to silk or rutile. Um, but uh, you could buy synthetic rubies in 1889. Um, so, you know, where one thing starts another. Uh, picks up. Uh, Herbert Smith, who published his uh, Gemstones book, Gemstones and Their Distinctive Character, um, he described four ways in which crystallization can occur. Separation of, of the substance from a saturated solution, temperature and pressure may be excessively high, Solidific solidification by cooling, and he uses ice as an example, uh, sublimation of vapor of the substance, direct passage from vapor to solid state, or precipitation of the substance from solution. Uh, this is in 1912. Now, at this point, we know that we've been producing synthetic uh, ruby, sapphire, and uh, it, was a, it was a big deal. Uh, he wrote um, that the high priests of jewelry were hastily convened to ban such unrighteous products. Um, that could easily be translated into the last you know, 10 years with uh, synthetic diamonds or lab-grown diamonds. Uh, but this was published in 1912 because at, at that time, you know, uh, 110 years ago, uh, the world of gemstones was in turmoil because we were growing rubies in a lab. We were growing gemstones, and it was felt that this was just the end of everything. Uh, we're still producing rubies and synthetic sapphires, uh, synthetic rubies and synthetic sapphires by the same process, the same method, uh, and the world has not ended. Now, at this point, in fact, we really don't see a lot of these synthetic other materials, because if you want a ruby, you can get a glass-filled one that's uh, natural in the sense that the ruby part of a glass-filled ruby did form in nature. The glass was in, in, introduced later, uh, and they're cheap as chips. So why would you grow a synthetic one? It's more expensive. They're still available. And of course, as gemologists, we see things that aren't the most recent production. Uh, Moissan, who, who uh, has a, a gem named after him, uh, Moissanite, uh, was a, a, an important experimenter in synthetic diamond. So we knew we could grow synthetic ruby, but we wanted to grow synthetic diamond. Um, he was a, a professor at the Sorbonne. He studied under Frémy, uh, Frémy who uh, was the professor of uh, Auguste Verneuil, who 
perfected the repeatable commercial process of growing synthetic uh, corundum. Uh, so he studied under Frémy, and he he produced very high temperature. Uh, he created carbon-rich iron and then suddenly quenched the carbon-rich iron, uh, thinking that the high temperature and then the, the, the massive sudden pressure change uh, by quenching it uh, would perhaps produce diamond. So massive pressure, high temperature were produced, and diamonds were not, unfortunately. Uh, there were diamonds from some of these experiments where it was rumored that the, uh, the students, in fact, sent some diamonds to the laboratory, natural diamonds to laboratories for analysis because uh, they wanted to help out their professor or they're fed up with things blowing up perhaps. Now, in the United States, um, uh, J. Willard Hershey, he was a professor in, uh, in um, the uh, McPherson College in Kansas, and he decided that it was time to pick up um, the uh, Moissan's uh, work and try and perfect it. He knows that it was, it was a process that was moving along well. It was likely to be producing diamond somehow or other, but it just needed a little more advanced methodology. So this is a book that was published in 1940, um, not long before he died. And uh, he, uh, he was a, pr a professor at the university, taught chemistry, uh, and his book, The Book of Diamonds, Their Curious Lore, Pro uh, Properties, Tests, and Synthetic Manufacture. This is in 1940, remember this. So he's specifically stating about the manufacture of synthetic diamond. Um, and he may not have been a, 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 a fine draftsman, but he did a, a drawing of the uh, system that he used for producing these diamonds. Uh, the specimens are uh, represented in a page from his book, the largest synthetic diamond on record, magnified 40 diameters, uh, a synthetic diamond magnified, magnified 30 diameters. Um, so they're pages from his actual book. He submitted diamonds to uh, the Gemological Institute of America. And uh, he, in 1939, uh, was pleased to say, we endeavored to begin where Massan, he, he, he spelled it Masso in the, in the uh, journal, Gems and Gemology, um, had left off. In other words, Massan got so far, but we've got to the point where we have actually produced diamond. Um, and uh, he has an article in Gems and Gemology, comments made on the tested synthetic diamonds. He submitted specimens to GIA, he submitted specimens of known diamond and specimens of what he grew. Uh, and uh, Robert Shipley, who was with GIA, of course, uh, stated that the specimens sent to GIA were diamond uh, to, the great, to the greatest part. Um, however, it uh, isn't stating that um, uh, Hershey actually produced diamond. He just, it's stating that what was submitted to GIA was diamond. Um, and again, it's felt that what was submitted to GIA was diamond from the same laboratory, but not in fact from the experiments by Hershey, unfortunately. Uh, students at the college uh, have attempted several times in recent years to reproduce Hershey's work and produce diamond by the same method. Uh, but they have much more sophisticated uh, technology than uh, Shipley had at the time. Uh, GIA has much more sophisticated technology, of course, as well. Um, and uh, every experiment through uh, the college has proven to produce no diamonds, unfortunately. Uh, the Mu Museum of Arts in McPherson, Kansas, uh, says that the museum houses information about the first man-made diamond large enough to be visible, created in McPherson, Kansas. Uh, they don't actually have the diamond or diamonds. Uh, and I, I, I asked them about it and they said, no, no, we don't, we don't know where they are. Uh, so it's a bit, it's a bit odd. Uh, in the New York Times, his obituary, uh, J. Willard Hershey, does describe that uh, He's widely known for his experiments with rare gases and he collaborated with Simon Lake, uh, it, working on the synthetic combinations, air combinations and underseas craft, dime, uh, uh, submarines and so forth, but also uh, that he was credited with making the world's largest synthetic diamond, uh, which is very exciting. But uh, 
it would appear that there weren't any. However, 1940, um, you know, three years before Her Hershey died, General Electric, Carborundum, and Norton um, set up a, uh, a team to research and develop methods experimenting in diamond synthesis. Uh, the uh, war interrupted, the Second World War interrupted, and it was stopped. But this is, well, Hershey was, was still experimenting in Kansas. Um, but if you look at the names, General Electric, a very big uh, corporation that dealt with and deals with many, many things, but Carborundum and Norton are abrasive companies. Uh, the experimentation was probably not to grow uh, gemstones. The experimentation was to grow abrasives because it was very important to, to be able to grow abrasives. However, with the interruption of the war, the project stopped. And in 1951, General Electric set up a team once more. And they experimented and they experimented and in 1954, after many, many trials, uh, they did grow diamonds by a high pressure method. Um, the crystals on the right hand side, it's from uh, Kurt Nassau's Gems Made by Man again. Uh, these are uh, 0.5 millimeters. These are crystals that are grown to bolster the supply of abrasive materials. And Tracy Hull was uh, one of the team. He was uh, he was presented with an award and the the uh, the, the note in the award says he was the first to discover a reproducible reaction system for making synthetic diamonds from graphite. And probably the most important part is uh, experimentation that reliably produced something that was repeatable and therefore uh, documented and, and people could uh, emulate that, that process. Very, very important. Simultase simultaneously in, in Sweden, uh, ASEA, um, was producing uh, experiments to grow diamond as well. They uh, did not publicly announce the result of their experimentation, but it is known that they were, they were experimenting with diamond synthesis at the same time as General Electric and succeeded in growing diamond, more or less the same time as General Electric. And there are crystals of their uh, uh, the results of their experimentation, they're produced at around the same time, 1954 or so. Uh, the results of their experimentation were private, but it was announced in 1980, much, much later, that they had in fact uh, coincided, a little bit like uh, like uh, Carol Chatham and, and um, um, uh, Gilson uh, in producing emerald synthetically by a flux process in the 1930s, entirely independently, but almost identical time and the same method, more or less. 1970, General Electric said that they first produced uh, gem quality synthetic diamond. Now, their aim was not to produce gemstones. Their aim was to produce uh, abrasives. The manufacturing of a single car uh, requires approximately two carats of diamond. Now, they're not using gemstones. They're using uh, high quality abrasives. And, and now synthetic diamond can be grown in in particular grit sizes as needed, um, but the the fact that they could grow transparent large enough crystals that could be gemstones was a big 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 thing. Uh, but again, once uh, Tracy Hull's methods, the General Electric methods, were were known and and reproducible, other people said, "Okay, here's how they did it." we're going to experiment as well. And the crystal on the right-hand side is it's by Sumitomo, a Japanese company. Uh, it's a, a, a crystal just under a carat uh, produced by Sumitomo. It's, it has uh, you know, noticeable metallic inclusions. It's attracted to a magnet. It's grown by high pressure, high temperature method, uh, which we really don't use very much for most gem diamonds these days. But it's, it's gem quality, probably I1 if you were to, to cut it into a gemstone. And of the sort of brown, brownish yellow color that is most commonly seen in, in transparent crystals from that uh, method around that time. Um, so here, here we have a whole bunch of uh, high pressure, high temperature grown uh, synthetic diamonds, a few crystals, a number of colors, uh, the, the pink, the red are produced by subsequent, uh, the, the color is produced by subsequent uh, annealing and treatment, um, but the yellows, uh, the blues, and the colorless are, are more or less uh, as grown in, in, in these cases. Uh, now you can see lots of inclusions in some of these. The high pressure, high temperature 
uh, gems were more frequently, uh, more noticeably included. Uh, chemical vapor deposition, CVD, the method which we see for most uh, gem lab-grown diamonds, we'll call them now, uh, is CVD. Uh, it's not requiring the same presses. It's uh, sort of a modification on, on microwave technology, essentially. So on the right-hand side, we have a tablet, a plate of CVD diamond. It's absolutely clean. It's colorless. Uh, and you know one of the one of the reasons we may produce uh, synthetic diamond is for non-gem purposes, uh, abrasives, but also a heat sink. If we if we can place a microprocessor on diamond uh, instead of silicon, it's a better heat sink, and we can produ produce smaller and smaller uh, chips uh, using a diamond substrate, and we can produce very very. Uh, substantial diamonds. And the diamonds on the left-hand side, they're all CVD. They're 60 points and, and a carat, uh, four of each, um, and clean and very, very uh, fine color. Um, in Tucson 2020, I went to someone who was advertising they were selling uh, CVD lab-grown diamonds from India. Uh, so I put a little scoop of them, uh, and here we have. Uh, Interestingly, 50% of them appear to be CVD, 25% of them are high pressure, high temperature grown synthetic, and 25% are natural. Uh, I, was, I was quite struck by that, uh, that revelation. And these are, you know, four or five point diamonds. Now, at the same time, General Electric was producing lab grown diamonds for uh, uh, mechanical, manufacturing, uh, non-gem purposes, a company called Element 6, which was a division of De Beers, was also producing uh, non-gem diamonds. Uh, the Element 6 company was not in the business of manufacturing diamonds for gemstones, but they were manufacturing for manufacturing purposes. Um, however, uh, it was seen, you know, the writing was on the wall. So uh, Element 6 uh, sort of spun off a division called Lightbox. Lightbox is uh, manufacturing in the United States of America, and they're producing diamonds basically in three colors, colorless and blue and pink. Uh, they're producing um, diamonds into the size of several carats. And when they introduced these diamonds, their whole purpose was to sort of bring a single price structure. That wasn't their whole purpose. They're, one of the things they did was to bring a single price structure to what they offered, $800 US per carat. Uh, $800 US per carat. They were not selling unmounted stones. They are now. Uh, they now have two sort of divisions. There's the higher level, $1,500 a, a carat US, and the conventional $800 a carat US. So if you buy a quarter carat, uh, it's going to be uh, $200. If you buy a two carat, it's $1,600. Um, now, obviously, the, the their standardized price structure is very, very interesting because it doesn't change based on size. It does change based on quality now because they did introduce this second level at $1,500. But you can see we've got uh, the, the prices here in Canadian because I pulled this off the uh, the light box um, uh, website uh, in Canada. So the, the price for a uh, three quarter carat is eight hundred fifty five dollars. That's Canadian, but it's based on eight hundred dollars a carat U.S. Um, there's a carat and an eighth princess, thirteen hundred dollars Canadian. Um, uh, one and a half carat pink. 1750 Canadian, all based on $800 a carat. Uh, and it doesn't, it doesn't matter what size it is. It doesn't matter what clarity is. And it does not matter what color it is. It's just $800 or, or $1,500 or a carat. As the size gets bigger, the price gets lower relative to what a natural diamond would be if you were pricing it. And, and you know, everyone tends to use Rappaport as a sort of a, <clears throat> a, a a background for pricing, not necessarily how we actually price things, but how much back from Rappaport. So if you look at a quarter carat, it's 50% back from Rappaport. If you look at a two carat, it's 96% back from Rappaport. Uh, obviously, there are big differences there. If you look at other people selling small diamonds, the prices are lower. Now, one company called Brilliant Earth is selling lab-grown diamonds. If you look, 
we have a list here of 165,395 lab-grown diamonds, ranging up to 21.05 carats. Uh, so that's a uh, you know one heck of a lot of diamonds. And if you look at at James Allen, you look at a lot of different websites. There's a, a stunning amount of lab-grown diamond available. It's still less in total numbers and in total carats than natural diamonds that are available. But we see uh, real uh, changes in how things are priced. And this is this is James Allen. This is a couple, just a couple of their larger diamonds. Um, these are pretty close to 90% back from Rappaport. A lab created or lab grown are the, the terms most people use these days. 11.15 carat E, SI1, $97,000 for an 11 carat diamond or $132,000 for a 12.57 uh, carat round brilliant cut diamond. It's uh, it's quite interesting to look at how, how the prices are structured. Here's uh, a from Brilliant Earth, back to Brilliant Earth, a 19.01 carat for 136,000 Canadian dollars. That's, you know, give or take, that's 100,000 United States, uh, US dollars for a 19 carat vs one h uh, So we can, we can grow them big. And this is where, uh, you know, the, the, the rules change and they're, they're getting bigger and bigger all the time. So it's very, very interesting. Uh, at our auction, uh, and I, I'm not trying to uh, to flout or anything, but uh, 1.35 carat diamond, the round one on the left-hand side, uh, sold in June for $485,000. It's an I1 natural fancy grayish blue. The uh, James Allen diamond here, 6.54 carats, fancy deep blue, rather a nice color, $42,000, $111. It's just uh, it, 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 it's night and day. There's no there's no way to make comparisons between these things, and we can uh, see the prices of these changing day by day. This is the kind of thing you don't want to have in your inventory because the price will be lower next week than it is this week. Uh, there's a, an organization called Green Lab Creations, and this is from uh, a blog, a gem blog from IGI. And IGI has been doing uh, identification uh, and grading reports for lab-grown diamonds for, for quite some time. And this is, you know, the world's largest diamonds, but this is May 2022. So a 27.27 carat diamond, the, the marquise-shaped one, 20.24, the, the pair, and 15.16 uh, on the right-hand side. Uh, that was the um, biggest at the time. And this is, of course, ages ago because it was May this year, 27.27 uh, carats. Now, obviously, the, the two on the left-hand side, the left-hand one and the middle one, the, the left of the three, um, they're not fabulously cut. But if you're trying to break a record, you're going to cut the biggest stone you can, the same as if you have a really exceptional um, sapphire you're going to cut a big stone rather than a pretty stone in in most cases to keep the weight. However, all of these have been eclipsed because now we have the pride of India, um, which is by ethereal green diamond in India. Um, their uh, slogan is diamonds are forever rewon. Um, it's 30.18 carats and it was grown in four weeks and it was released and exhibited in uh, uh, in June this year. So, you know, two months later, one month later, uh, a 30 carat. So it's, you know, a record breaking diamond, but this is, you know, this is just where it is. And this is the beginning of things uh, moving forward. Now, obviously if you have the record breaking one, it's going to be very expensive because it's it's the record breaking one. So now a twenty seven carat one. Well, well, who cares? You know, there's a ton of them. On the uh, Lightbox website, one of the questions that I think many many of us are, are asking is, uh, do lab grown diamonds have any resale value? Uh, and it's uh, Lightbox says it depends on the price you pay for lab grown. Originally. Uh, they say it's a relatively new process, but they also say we have a standard single price structure. So it's $800 a carat or $1,500 a carat, and that's it. So the price won't change. Uh, so therefore, if you bought an $800 a carat diamond from us this year, 
it in three years time you can buy another eight hundred dollar carat one that's the same because our price is fixed as it's a standard thing uh they're a bit unusual because their prices haven't changed lightbox has retained that eight hundred dollar carat price uh for the rest of the world you know if you have an in, uh, inventory of diamonds lab grown diamonds you put in your safe two years ago they're worth a lot less than they than that you could sell them for a lot less than you could have when you bought them and that's you know a very very big thing um this is a question that that i wonder about uh from a company called k this is uh, from a, a web advertising they say lab created diamonds by k earrings they have a quarter carat total weight i think it was a quarter carat um yeah, total carat in sterling silver. However, there's an asterisk. Due to supply constraints, these earrings may include natural diamonds. Uh, that's just a striking thing because the fact that they may contain natural diamonds and they're more or less apologetically saying we may not be able to provide you with the lab-grown diamonds you're looking for, uh, but we can provide you with some kind of diamonds. And that sort of spells out, uh, like that group of diamonds I bought in Tucson, the fact that with small diamonds melee, perhaps it's of very little consequence to many people, whether they're natural or uh, or synthetic. Um, Breitling Watch has announced that within the next year and a half, all diamonds in all of their timepieces will be lab grown, uh, and that's a that's a, a move they've they've made. They've announced it, and that's where they're going. And it's a question of you know how how we look at it. There, you know, it's advanced technology. It's very exciting. Uh, is it something that's more green or whatever? Um, but there are all sorts of shifts that are happening, and it's 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 quite something. And that's about everything I have to say, and I hope I haven't bored you too much. Uh, I just have a picture of, of, of Her Majesty the Queen, the late lamented, uh, and uh, I can probably say with some assurance that all of her diamonds were natural. But, you know, in the next generations, Kate, Williams, Megan, Harry's diamonds, their children's diamonds, uh, we may see that they're not, uh, that they're lab grown. Anyway, thank you very much, and I will... Uh, I will pass the baton. Thank you. Thanks very much, Duncan. But don't pass anything quite yet. We'd like to open up the uh, the, uh, the 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 microphone for questions. So there's been an awful lot of new information thrown out there. Please, audience, you can unmute for this next little bit and ask uh, any questions you feel will be uh, interesting to you and helpful to the audience. Verbally, you don't have to put it on chat. Hi, Duncan. Archana, will you? Can you hear me? I can indeed. Hi, okay. Archana. Uh, uh, Duncan, I just wanted to know you saying that uh, luxury watches are going to be including lab grown diamonds, but with luxury watches having such a high value on them, if they include lab grown diamonds, would the value go down in the future or are they expecting to still? have the value because of their name? Uh, it's a very it's a very good question. I th I think uh, the jury is out on that. The jury is out on, on a lot of things to do with lab grown diamonds. Um, so one company has announced, uh, Breitling has announced that their, their uh, watches will have lab grown and they are a luxury watch brand. They're, uh, they probably gave very serious and long consideration to whether it was going to be something that's that might damage their brand or not damage their brand. It's a luxury watch brand. Our lab-grown diamonds, uh, they're, they're a new thing. Uh, there's discussion about whether they're uh, uh, environmentally better. You know, does it take more energy to produce a diamond or mine a diamond, to grow a diamond or mine a diamond? Uh, I don't know the answer to that, and I don't know if anyone else knows the answer to that. Uh, the 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 company. Uh, wants to have sort of the latest in technology you know watches are very very competitive and they compete to say we've got you know the thinnest the fastest the most automatic the most complicated the best technology and you know to say we have this brand new thing lab grown diamonds in our watches is perhaps just sort of adding to the excitement about the technology connected to a watch Will it diminish the brand in the future? You know, people went to quartz watches 
uh, and just about every brand in the world went to courts. And then just about every brand in the world walked away from courts because courts wasn't in fact the thing that made it a, a watch uh, prestige thing. So who, who, who knows really, but it's um, it, it, a lot of this remains to be seen. Thank you, just Duncan. So long way of saying, no, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so it's more like greenwashing the public. <laughs> I, I have a question regarding. Please state the, who you are. Oh, I'm Antoinette Matlins. And a fabulous presentation, by the way. Um, I really had some very interesting insights thanks to your research and information. The one thing that was initially a major issue was the difficulty that, or the expense of separating natural from lab grown diamonds um, and the fear that was associated with diamonds in general because people were afraid. And it seems to me, based on some of the new instrumentation I've seen in my own testing, which I'm not going to discuss here because I'm not ready to make a, a broad general statement, is that there are, in fact, affordable and fairly inexpensive ways to separate them, even melly, and that as the opportunities and the and the technology becomes available to quickly and easily distinguish one from the other, that it will be like synthetic rubies, emeralds, and sapphires in the sense that it will open a new market, a different market. But the rarity and the preciousness of the natural grown versus those that can be mass produced will result in leveling prices for the lab grown, but strengthening prices for the finest natural diamonds, and that you will have a very similar situation to what we see with other laboratory created gems like rubies and sapphires um, versus their natural counterparts. It uh, sounds more like a, a statement rather than a question, Antoinette. Well, I was no, I was just about to get to the question. I wanted to know what you think about that situation or the role of identification techniques. In may I, may I step in just price. for a second, Antoinette? We'll be dealing with that in the, in the next section. Can you hold that? Oh, sure. So, uh, okay. Antoinette, I can answer that. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, uh, the the difficulty is most of us could probably get our loop out and look at a you know curved stri or gas bubbles in a, in a synthetic ruby if it's a, fl a flame fusion. Uh, I can I can look at uh, a, a lab grown diamond with my loop until the cows come home and and I'm not going to get any further ahead. Uh, Branco is going to cover is going to cover this territory of course. What what I'm finding when I was looking into pricing is essentially uh, there are very very few uh, uh, conventional size you know not 40 carats or whatever but conventional size lab grown diamonds that are less than 85 back from Rappaport. And there are very few of them that are more than 97 back from Rappaport, but it's basically 90 to 95 back from Rapp for, for most of them. Uh, Melee are, are, have sort of leveled off at a, at a, a slightly higher price price just because the cost of cutting them is a lot is higher um but yeah i think we i think in terms of pricing we'll we'll see some leveling where uh the you know it'll find its place if you walk into most jewelry stores today and say can i have a a synthetic ruby they'll go yeah no we don't do that um but if you ask for a lab grown diamond just about every jeweler i know will sell you one because you can get you know twice as much diamond for the price, and if they don't sell it to you, someone else will. But it, so it's <clears throat> we're we're learning a lot. But Branco is going to talk about the the relatively uh, the less costly methods, perhaps, and and a number of methods how they're produced and and how how we may look at these things now and in the future. Thank you. I just have one one quick little question here. I'm just curious. If, uh, Please identify that... yourself as Chris. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, my name is Chris Mullet. Um, uh, I was watching a video the other day, which, you know, kind of made me go back and forth. And my question is, do, does the introduction of synthetic or lab made uh, diamonds, uh, has that actually had um, an adverse or any other kind of effect on uh, genuine diamond prices? Um, I think uh, the, the short answer is, uh, I think we're not quite sure. There's been a lot of panic out there. Um, uh, in the last months, uh, diamond natural diamond prices 
in rough, uh, in other words, the sites from the mines, uh, has decreased somewhat uh, because they were they've been going up and up. Uh, the the price of melee is is uh, somewhat down, I think. But uh, I think a lot of people are 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 actively watching pricing because there's there's real genuine fear that that the lab grown diamonds are going to going to take a big kick at uh, at the natural diamond market. At the moment, it seems uh, there's a downward pressure because there are a lot of people who who just say, well, I can get a two carat for the price of a one carat, so I'll just buy that. Uh, so I think there the the pressure is down, uh, but I think it remains to be seen. You know, there's a there's a lot of um, uh, worry about just the whole world economy right now and do people actually want diamonds right thank you very much uh, sorry curious. to interrupt uh, ray there's one question by text uh, from ayers asking what are the other main uses of synthetic diamonds and uh, duncan for sure can answer but i can just tell there are many other uses and uh, the more uh, industrial diamonds are produced uh, annually much more than uh, gem quality and every drill uh, that is made in mining industry it's uh, made of synthetic diamond uh, top is a lab grown diamonds or the uh, when they do eye operation in in a, in a hospital they use special uh, knives made of uh, super uh, thin and super precise diamonds there are many applications in space industry there's a separate talks on that so i won't take too much time on answering this question but there, there are a lot of applications thanks michael i, I do have one quick question i do apologize to carry this out my name is randy i work as a gemologist appraiser in north carolina um wonderful talk duncan i just wanted to ask you real quick have you ever come across a book called the diamond makers by robert m hazen i haven't actually now i'm i'm i'm, I'm writing it down i i it was a wonderful book i'd come across several years ago I, I would just be curious to get your thoughts on that if if it's possible to grab your email at the very end of all of this i uh would like to keep in touch and maybe once you get around to reading it would like to gain your thoughts on it absolutely any other questions just going to comment that if uh i were buying a you know a diamond engagement ring which i'm not i've been married 45 years that's good um if because of concern about blood diamonds i'd be more likely to go for for a lab grown just because I would know it might be taking a lot of electricity to produce it, but it's not from uh, the Congo or some other uh, area. So go Canada. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I, I often wonder if the blood diamond thing is a cover up so that De Beers could still buy what they always bought and no one would compete with them. But anyway, that's just my private thoughts. Now made stupidly public. But anyway, any other questions? You won't get an argument from me about the beers. <laughs> Any other questions here? Well, thank you all, audience, for uh, your contributions. And particularly, thank you, Duncan, for a well-researched presentation. It certainly uh, filled in a lot of gaps uh, in terms of the, the, the back history that I had never heard of before. So I really appreciated that. And I think in the future, when we, once we've got this archived, others will enjoy it as well. So on to the second part of our program, perhaps a little bit more technical, but that won't take away from the ability of our speaker to translate that for us to understand. Our second speaker is a gentleman called Branko Deljanin. He's president and head gemologist of Canadian Gem Labs and director of gemological research industries in Vancouver. He's a research gemologist with extensive experience in advanced testing of diamonds and gemstones. Branko has conducted on-site research on gems and colored diamonds in Sri Lanka, Russia, Brazil, Australia, and has managed many projects on colored and synthetic diamonds to date. He's an expert on identification of natural treated and synthetic diamonds and gems from subsequent certification and works with standard instruments and advanced spectrometers to determine origin of color for colored diamonds and gems and provenance for pink diamonds, which I think is very interesting. Branko is an instructor of advanced gemology programs on diamonds and colored stones that he's offered all around the world. And he's been a regular contributor to trade and gemological magazines and presented reports at a number of prestigious research and gemological conferences, including Mediterranean Gemological Jewelry, as he co-founded in 2015. And his latest book, although we don't really promote things here so much, but it's worthy of note, uh, from 2021 is 
diamonds, natural, treated, elaborate, laboratory grown. So always see a man who is the perfect person to tell us more about this, the, the technology and the identification problems and questions and answers in regards to lab grown diamonds. So I'd like to welcome Branko. Please mute your 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 sites, everybody now, except for Branko, and we'll listen to what he has to share with us. Thank you very much, Branko. Uh, thank you, Ray, for inviting me, and good to see you and Duncan in Vancouver a couple of weeks ago when we planned this uh, webinar. I do my own webinars, as you know, and uh, many other speakers. Uh, for those who want to be more technical, uh, I would advise to check it out. Uh, most of them are free, unless they're part of Academy. I do a lot of consulting, a lot of research, as you mentioned, and conferences. This is what people know me about. Uh, not all of them in North America, some of them outside. But anyway, uh, let's talk about identification. This is the most uh, challenging and interesting, uh, at least for those who are gemologists and appraisers topic. Uh, not to uh, take away from Duncan, I really enjoyed his talk. And uh, for me, it's amazing that from 2015, when I tested the uh, 1001 VS1E diamond at the gemological uh, conference in Greece, and then went to new diamond technology in Russia, diamonds went three times bigger. So now there are 30 carats from 10 in like seven, eight years. So it's amazing uh, technology. I'm amazed with technology. I'm not promoting uh, any uh, of this saying it's better or worse. I'm not going to do discussion, but uh, how what we can do with the standard instruments and what we can do with advanced. Uh, I will focus more on a standard because most of you uh, do have uh, at least loop, uh, UV lamp, uh, hopefully cross polarized filters because this is what it's a part of synthetic diamond kit uh, that contain these three little instruments. You can see a picture on the right, uh, me using a portable polariscope under the microscope, which is the best option. You can even see small diamonds. You can even see solitaire diamonds, even melee diamonds, if you can see it from the side. Uh, of course, if it's a if it's a bezel set, you cannot. Other instrument, uh, I'm separating these in three different colors uh, because they're based on three different techniques. Uh, either they're based on transparency to short UV light. Uh, this is a blue uh, color. And one of them that I tested out of uh, uh, 11, I will just mention one is Ari from Presidium Singapore. Uh, then the, those, many of them are actually in the market based on fluorescence or phosphorescent uh, reactions. Uh, I tested at least six instruments, but I'll mention just two uh, today, the jewelry inspector uh, and the mini screen. Uh, and one that is based on spectroscopy uh, for those who has, and now more and more appraisers are buying portable advanced instruments. It's a, it's a trend for those who come to Tucson knows that, uh, for example, Marjorie Labs is selling this to appraisers. Uh, I have one for many years, EXA by Marjorie Labs. So I will cover these three. Before I go into that, I need to a uh, little bit for those who are, didn't take my lectures before or uh, didn't read any of my books or other books, a little bit on properties on these three groups, natural, HPHT grown and CVD grown. Even the both of the, all of them are made of carbon as a source, or this carbon is a, uh, this different source of carbon, as you know, graphite and HPHT grown or CH4, what is a methane gas in case of CVD. Very important to know this because we are looking at the properties. And we're looking for uh, first, you can see in blue uh, uh, line uh, type of diamonds. A majority of diamonds that are natural type 1A like 97, 98%, maybe, this means they contain nitrogen as impurity. It usually is a pair, two or four. If they are type 1B, what is very rare, the single nitrogen, uh, because they are quite uh, old diamonds, uh, they're not uh, so present uh, in a current uh, mining uh, output of the mine. Uh, on the opposite, uh, coralless diamonds that are uh, HPHT grown, the type 2A, this means they contain very little or almost non-nitrogen, less than maybe a uh, few uh, parts per million, same as CVD grown. And the very rare could be 1B yellow or 2B blue, talking about HPHT grown. And now we come to one uh, another column, what is in pink, that we're using fluorescence as the first line of defense. It's not only one way to separate. It's not so simple. I wish it is. In the first book, 2003, it was a big deal uh, to use fluorescence in 2007. We did a second edition. Uh, we still promote this, but it's one of the uh, three tests uh, I would recommend is to check fluorescence. If long UV is medium, strong, very strong blue, you, you don't have to check short UV. You know it's weaker. This is natural diamond. 
When it comes to weak fluorescence, it's a little more tricky. When it comes to non, diamonds uh, could be without fluorescence, of course, natural and uh, uh, laboratory grown. But if short UV is stronger than long UV, you see my second column, HPHT grown. And this is typical of HPHT grown with phosphorescing, even one minute or more than a minute, you're dealing with the HPHT grown diamond. And many melee diamonds in the jewelry today are HPHT grown. I've seen rings uh, last uh, few months that are mixed uh, HPHT grown and uh, natural. They just basically fill up the two, three or five diamonds that they're missing, uh, they're adding natural diamonds. So my, my clients uh, prefer to call it all laboratory grown, believe it or not. Um, this is support uh, Duncan uh, theory that, or <laughs> a story that is, uh, they're selling it sometimes without knowing what they're uh, selling. Uh, just to fill up the order. And sooty grown is the most trickiest to use for essence because for essence could be same or short to be slightly stronger. Very rare they, they will phosphorus maybe only for a few seconds. What we are to focusing on spectroscopy is this in green, what is the nitrogen impurities in position in type one diamond, in type uh, uh, one B, what is the HPHT grown yellow, it's a different position. And of course, if there is no nitrogen, we're talking about type 2 diamond, it most probably, not for sure, you are dealing with the lab grown diamonds. Could be 2 3% oh, of, of your natural diamonds. These are the colors uh, we are coming today. When I started uh, to look at the first lab grown diamond, 99, 2000, I was in Russia visiting uh, factories. They're mostly all of them yellows and blues, very little or almost non colorless. Then 2004, 5, they start to come. And we, we start to check them more. And um, of course, quality improved in the last 15 years. Uh, they could be uh, pink or red when they're post treated, irradiated. As you see, picture one of the fancy red or close to fancy red uh, lab grown diamonds. And they could be blue. Uh, HPHT grown, usually they're more uh, looking more like a natural blues. And CVD look more like a gray blue because uh, color is used to silicon. I did this research with the GRS uh, laboratory from Switzerland. So in the past, there were one carat, two carats, maybe maximum. As you know now, they're quite common, three, four, five carats, even in Vancouver. It's a relatively small city, two million, two and a half. And very now possible to see over five carats up to 30 carats. And this is an instruments I want to mention today. There are many instruments and there are many studies. And doing a lot of workshops around the world, people keep asking me, what... Uh, Vista can do, what uh, Sherlock Holmes can do. And uh, of course, I don't have all these instruments. So I, I, I took a little project to study during Corona, 11 instruments with the 50 samples, uh, around 50. And I did a lot of uh, study. I'll present at least five instruments today. Uh, transparency on short UV, UV light. I'll talk about ARI, but there are also other instruments, Vista and Diamond Screener. I'll talk about phosphorescence, fluorescence, uh, I'll talk about uh, PL jewelry inspectors, but the mini screen, but there's also diet through from OG, Shell Holmes, and many other instruments. There are many spectrometers, uh, different companies making them. I'll mention only EXA, not to promote only EXA, but just because I, I do use it all the time. And uh, there's, of, of course, other instruments by uh, Nicolette or, or, or Brooker, other companies. Uh, the biggest make instruments SIN detect, very different uh, technology based on very tiny photoluminescence time resolved. Uh, mini phosphorescence of natural diamond, basically. And there's an instrument that the final answer really to most cases when it's super clean, no fluorescence, no impurities, we're talking about diamond view or DFI uh, uh, deep uh, uh, laser from, from GGTL laboratory in, in Liechtenstein, they're talking about fluorescence imaging and fluorescence spectroscopy. Let's go from basic to what's advanced and something that I will encourage every person to buy if you don't have it, cross polarized filters or mini polariscope, you can see on top left how it looks, uh, one that is really $100 uh, or so. Why? Because you can see the strain in the middle on the left, it's a natural diamond. It has a, a quite visible multicolor strain. On the bottom left is a more crossed uh, pattern in a type 2A, in this case, CVD grown diamond. So this is the instruments I studied, 11 instruments, and goes from $525 from the kit all the way to $10,000 for EXA. I'm not gonna promote this instrument directly or indirectly, I'm just telling you they're on the market. I studied these because I have access to them. Some of them I do have on my website, some of them I don't, it's not like, a, but I will really mention that all of them are good as long as you know how to use them. And I strongly advise not to use only one. This is my message on this talk. 
use two or three instruments. If you have four, use four. Uh, I do I do have a chance to use at least five in my laboratory, but I'm using usually two, two, sometimes three. It's usually it's enough. So first is how to check uh, diamond under uh, cross polarized filters. You, you rotate the diamond, of course, uh, better to hold it, table to cool it, and look from the pavilion. On the left, you can see typical tatami pattern in a type two diamond. With my colleague Dushan Simic and uh, Sherry Woodring, uh, uh, we used to work together and, and do this lot of this testing in 2000, 2001, 2002. Why? Because at that time we were checking if diamond is type 2A in a matter of five, 10 seconds, because the many HPHT enhanced natural diamond on the market, it's faster than infrared to check this technique. And then we will check it with another instruments. On the right, you can see a typical pattern in a type 1A diamond. You can see this pattern on the right, so strong, you deal with natural diamond. Of course, you can support it with fluorescence and other techniques of what I do, but this is a strong indication you're dealing with natural diamond. If I have an option on the left, I would use more tests because sometimes CVT grown diamond could be mistaken with a type 2A natural diamond. Uh, I, in my opinion, HPHT grown are more easier to, uh, to test, uh, not only because they're fluorescing and phosphorescing, uh, not all of them, again, majority of them, because when you look at the cross polarized filters and rotate them, they look transparent without any strain. The reason why, because they're grown in a relatively short time, couple of days in HPHT presses, and they're without uh, impurities. If you see on top, uh, in the middle, there's a huge metallic inclusion. This is different. This is just from the crucibles, from the catalyst they're using, usually iron, cobalt, and nickel. This is a picture from one of the uh, uh, speakers at my conferences on laboratory ground diamonds from China that he is showing his stones from China, but this didn't change too much. Uh, we see this pattern even nowadays, uh, like bottom left is really typical uh, parallel pattern in CVD grown diamonds, particular to the table. Probably stone is not HPHT treated uh, at that time in the beginning or, or to 10 years ago, most of them were not enhanced. Now they are HPHT enhanced to improve the color. Uh, sometimes a pattern is could be uh, looking as a natural diamond. In my opinion, pattern is always more coarse, more stronger, and uh, more obvious than in very settled uh, type 2A tatami pattern. This is my experience, but of course they can, as you can see in the book we, we did with Dushan, if, when they hit the diamond over 2000 degrees uh, enhancement, they can uh, reduce this pattern to look like a natural diamond. Not on purpose, it just happened that they want to get high color. Fluorescence is a big, big topic. I have a special booklet just on fluorescence because it's such an important technique. Uh, I, this is my first test I will do after looping the, any piece of jewelry or loose diamond. I will loop it and then use fluorescence. You can see in this bracelet, you see stones in the middle, strong blue natural diamond. On the left, maybe medium blue, also natural diamond. There are some stones that don't fluoresce and more than half of the stone on the market natural do not fluoresce. But if they fluoresce, 90% fluoresce blue. Why? Because they have entry center or a 415 line that are causing this for us. What's the problem? In the last few years, uh, some companies, I'm not saying only Diamond Foundry, that is US-based uh, company. Uh, there, I've, I've seen a lot of the stones just happen that uh, a retailer in Vancouver buying from them and from other sources. So I see a lot of them and um, some of them usually the lazy inscribe as well. You, you, you can see, this is a picture uh, done by a PL inspector uh, with uh, my cell phone. Almost the same fluorescence and the long UV in short UV. You can argue there's a little bit difference, but I can say, technically speaking, this is the same fluorescence, very similar. You can say weak, greenish yellow or yellowish green, uh, not uh, enough to separate based on fluorescence only. And I'm bringing this sample snob to my latest workshops. And this is the article I actually did for the Italian magazine in 2022, just a few months ago. And uh, I'm very looking forward for the actual next conference in Italy. It will be in two years. On, uh, and I'll bring more samples. This is a basically results of this synthetic kit. You can see on the top what you can do with the two instruments if you really practice. You can check fluorescence, and in case uh, natural, it's obviously stronger long UV. In second column, it's HPHT grown. You can see how much stronger is uh, on the short UV. The stone will probably uh, also phosphorus. And on the on the on the far right, you see uh, CVT grown diamond. Uh, this one actually is from Greece. And fluorescence is a little bit stronger than the short UV light. Not always like this, but if you see this, you're dealing with the uh, CVD ground. Bottom, you here see pattern uh, in type one is what I showed before. It's like uh, at the angle from pavilion and uh, tatami 
edge bridge tiburon no pattern and cvd has a, a in this case cross pattern and this is what i can tell you what is the use of this kit that i'm using it at my workshops another instrument that is a backup of the peel inspector that is also very useful for other gemstones of course is a, a jewelry inspector you can put pistol jewelry uh, a little bit larger uh, rings mostly and bracelets or you can just go over your big uh, necklace it's jewelry inspector and show you how it looks uh, on the earrings on the left you see uh, almost non maybe weak uh, bluish fluorescence on the left earring and medium uh, blue i can say on the right ear on the short uv light is is very different uh, medium to strong greenish yellow yellowish green doesn't matter and phosphorescence and no or very weak uh, blue on the uh, earring of the right that is natural diamond earring of the left it's it's lab grown diamond this is part of my collection uh, doesn't happen so often in the earrings but does happen in the rings that you have a mixture of, of natural and uh, usual HPHT grown diamond. I've seen a few CVD melees, which is very unusual, but uh, happening. So don't be, don't disregard CVD mele and the more difficult to test them because they don't fluoresce so obviously. This one instrument that uh, many jewelers now are getting or using it as the first line of defense is not is not uh, nothing against the instrument. But in my rating, this is the uh, lowest one with the with the, with the, uh, a referral or actually the highest referral by because it's based on transparency to UV light, and you should be very careful how you're using it, not to, to, to touch the metal or it has a, a tip what is good. This is their latest uh, production, better than uh, previous one that was $600, this is around maybe $1,200. Uh, it will refer what is probably synthetic, but doesn't mean it could be also natural, could be also uh, unusual uh, type that is a, a type 1AB or something that is a, a, a transparent UV light. So that's why you should be very careful with this test. Don't use only one instrument. This is my message uh, with using ARI or any other, uh, uh, we call it uh, black box instrument that give you readings. I prefer to give samples to people and teach them how to identify it. This is my uh, part of my collection. You can see, I'll just go quickly through this. If you have a workshop with me now, I'll give you these stones and tell you this is blue diamond. Obviously, this is my old, old production, obviously metallic I2 inclusion, is magnetic, phosphorescing, and no pattern on the cross polarized filters. Finished. No need for spectroscopy. Uh, the other one is an unusual stone because it's fancy light brownish greenish yellow. It looks like a natural yellowish uh, cape diamond, but has a amorphous crystal, quite visible in this case. So they're not crystallized uh, uh, carbon from, from gas. And fluorescence is stronger than short TV light and has a columnar pattern. Again, this is enough to tell it's CVD, but of course we can use spectroscopy and find 737 uh, line. And this is a typical uh, faint pink uh, off color uh, argyle stone that has a strong blue fluorescence, weak blue, cape lines, and strong pattern. This is a bread and butter natural diamonds. And on the bottom one is very tricky stone. Why? Because fluorescence is very similar to long UV and short UV. We can say very weak, weak, but maybe even both of them are weak or very weak. It depends on the how strict you are with your uh, grading end, but have a strong columnar pattern. This is why it's important not to check only fluorescence, not to check only one type of instrument. You should combine different techniques, uh, especially on jewelry. Uh, 2008, I was in a conference in Berlin and I, I met people from Ukraine uh, who were growing diamonds. And actually uh, the person, Andrei Katrusha, who was uh, giving me some stones and I, I cut them, we cut them and make them melee. Uh, he was one responsible for growing the largest uh, diamonds at that time, uh, 2010, 15, uh, 20, HPHT grown, up to 20 carats I've seen. Uh, so uh, just uh, about that time, or a few years earlier, 2004, we saw first uh, Mele yellow diamonds, uh, Dushan Simic, my colleague in New York, put in jewelry. Uh, we couldn't believe it, but it, it, it was there and we proved it. We put a press release and uh, since then or earlier, they're doing this, but uh, only 2010, 2015, it was a few articles in other magazine about Mela's uh, lab grown diamonds uh, because uh, big labs just start to lo look at them and big lab doesn't look amount the uh, stones, they look at the loose stones. So what we cannot use, we cannot use classic spectrometers based who designed for single stones. We cannot use cross polar filters in most of the time if they're uh, small diamonds and if they're bezel set. We can use uh, some limited uh, magnification. We can use uh, some fluorescence uh, for sure, and a possible some R instrument out of these five. And definitely we can use fluorescence spectroscopy or we call PL 
spectroscopy. It's a laser uh, 365, uh, what is a long UV uh, light laser uh, developed by uh, Marjorie Labs in EXA instrument. This is one instrument I will mention. Why? Because uh, uh, some of you asking before, or I know my webinars about Sherlock Holmes and different uh, instrument based on fluorescence. This is a similar instrument, uh, a company DRC Techno. It's uh, relatively small, uh, can fit maybe, I put here, as you can see on the left, uh, three, four, five pieces of jewelry. Uh, they make also bigger model. A uh, few manufacturers of jewelry in Canada and America using it because they can put many pieces of jewelry at the same time. Uh, here different modes, and if you see on the left uh, why it's uh, used, because uh, software helping people to circle, you can see this on the top left, uh, green and, uh, and blue uh, squares, these are for sure synthetic diamond, in this case the HPHT ground. On the top right and the middle, on the right side of the ring, it's especially we made the ring mixture on the left natural, on the right the CVD ground, it will circle for further testing. Uh, these stones and uh, will not circle uh, stones that are natural or in this case uh, bottom right their CZs is not designed for CZ but CZ is relatively easy to, uh, to identify. On the right uh, here's the four different modes you can put fluorescence mode you can see how uh, uh, this earring on the left out of two that is not circle on the left screen it's blue fluorescence so this is natural diamond and uh, the other ones uh, you have to do interpretation but basically uh, people like this kind of instrument. I'm showing here not to promote, but to tell you that is it's on the market. People are using it, and people like this kind of uh, black boxes that tells you what to do. Uh, again, um, I am gemologist. And, uh, I know it uh, uh, takes longer to train people, but once you're trained to take my workshops, it, it's much better to make your own decision. So you can see here some rings and earrings that are part of uh, uh, workshops, and you can see how it's relatively. I don't say it's easy, it's not. Uh, uh, this ring on the top uh, uh, second from the bottom is a mixture of CVD, grown melee, and natural. This is a not easy stone, why? Because fluorescence is really a tiny bit stronger, weak. You have to look in the absolute dark or use the box, like a jewel inspector is completely covered so you can make a pictures with your camera and then decide. Because if you do it in a, in a retail environment or appraisal store, the bottle of light, if you do it that way, you will miss this weak fluorescence. And very difficult to see this columnar pattern if it's a small uh, diamond, but you can look and try, put under the microscope uh, and uh, put cross polarized filters and see the, the columnar pattern. Of course, fluorescence will help in uh, uh, natural and HPHT grown, no problem. Even helps with the pink diamond that have a strong orange fluorescence under long UV and short UV and uh, type to a pattern and the cross polarized filters. So it's uh, easy, not easy, but you can see it's not natural diamond. The only conf conf confusion could be that maybe it's natural treated, but it, uh, again, you have to use spectroscopy for that. It's not always possible. I'm not saying uh, standard instruments are magical and you can use them two or three and identify everything. Uh, in the article I mentioned in this Italian magazine, I'm very happy for those who wants to uh, pass read their emails or forward this article. Uh, it's not about this, this article published, but this article is showing uh, three steps how to test your diamond in less than five minutes. One test I, I show you to cross polarized filters, I would recommend it, fluorescence. And third one that I will do in my laboratory as uh, most of the time, if, I, if, if these two tests don't give you results is EXA, natural diamond detector. Why? Because it will give you uh, 97, 98% will pass natural diamonds, which is good. Two, 3%, you need to do more, uh, more tests or back it up with other instruments. And this is a, a summary of the results. Um, uh, natural diamond because the he has nitrogen they will fluoresce mostly blue you can see even blue picture uh, this is 365 laser on the bottom left you can see typical cape lines uh, you don't have to know all these peaks but i know of course 415 5, 452 478 that's the pattern you need to know and match it in database second one in the middle is typical hpht grown why typical because it has a nickel as impurity Catalyst is not always uh, diamond has a nickel. So don't expect all HPHT ground to have this. Actually, majority don't have such a spectra, but uh, pattern is there. Uh, what I'm saying about around 500, here's some band, and this is what you're looking. And it's a say refer. Uh, and then uh, most uh, important, CVD, I would always check stones with fluorescence with the EXA. Why? Because uh, most of them, or I, I study 
over 100 stones just around New Year from our manufacturers. Actually, in one day, believe it or not, it took me 10 hours. Uh, but uh, all of them had 737 uh, silicon vacancy little peak that is proving that it's CVD grown. So this is a summary. I'm going to summarize here five instruments. I'm not going to talk about each column with you. I want to save uh, time for questions. But 11 instruments are covered in that book, Diamonds, that uh, Ray mentioned. And uh, uh, very important to know limitation of your instruments. They're very important. Not, it's not magical. And this is a typical mistake to put uh, LMN color uh, in an in instrument and, and, oh, it, it's synthetic. But you have to check. J-mini is designed from D2K. Even excess is D2N. Uh, you can check other stones, color diamonds, but you have to really be a spectroscopist, be trained to look at the spectra. Uh, Drew inspector, aesthetic kit, uh, peel inspector, and cross polar filters you can do for any diamond, colored or colorless, but you have to be careful because sometimes it's not easy to see a pattern in color diamond. And again, this is a different time. Sometimes it's just three, five seconds. Sometimes uh, like J Mini takes 45 to 50, 60 seconds for one test because they're doing four different measurements. And then here's another accuracy. I will come to accuracy later, but there's a different accuracy from 90% to 97, 99 even with EXA. Depends on the also uh, how much money you want to invest and what is your uh, uh, current uh, typical uh, piece of jewelry or, or diamonds, if, if it's possible to be typical. This is a poster uh, published by John Chapman, who is uh, actually a manufacturer of the instrument, also Gemetrix. Uh, we did together for the GS Symposium like now five years ago almost. Uh, I'll just quickly go for the chart and um, not to promote uh, too much uh, what I'm doing, but anyway, I can give this chart with the pictures to anybody who just leave me the email. No problem. It's a free, uh, I want to do free education for those who really wants to know the steps uh, because it's uh, it's published. Uh, first, use loop or microscope, of course. Loop is not enough anymore because most Lebron are VS to VVS. Some of them SA1, uh, you can see maybe easy with loop and it could be good. Uh, if metallic inclusions and magnetic, synthetic then you check fluorescence in case that short uv is obviously stronger and they phosphorus you're dealing with hp ground diamond finished in case that long uv is stronger this is the opposite uh, uh, box from uh, from short uv long uv is stronger and you see a pattern like anomalous typical uh, that, uh, strong pattern multicolored or tatami typical it's it's natural but very often diamonds do not fluoresce this is a problem then none you check uh, cross process filters, but you're not sure because you didn't practice or you, you don't have enough. It looks like it could be uh, type 2 a natural, but maybe it's CVD. You're not sure. This is the case. You need to go to advanced instruments and check. This I put core or course uh, pattern, very uh, not easy to, uh, to, to separate. Then we check spectroscopy. If it's type 2A, definitely we do more tests. If it's type 1, uh, is natural. Then we check for growth sector pattern and photoluminescence. That this is advanced instruments we're using in the laboratory. I'm not talking about this today because uh, most of you are not uh, lab gemologists. But uh, some workshops I do bring uh, advanced instruments. And this is the case. It's published in this article. That's why um, I offer to you that how it's easy to make a mistake if you are just assuming or doing two tests, not three, not four. This is the diamond, 405 carat ring here in Vancouver. A couple of months ago, uh, uh, one couple was divorcing and uh, she wanted to, to make, to sell this diamond. And, and she went to one other uh, small lab or appraiser. And she, he actually doesn't matter, uh, use uh, maybe uh, some tests, maybe check fluorescence and saw this is what I see. That under long UV is strong uh, yellowish green, under short UV is definitely weaker, weak to medium. I mean, this is the first sign that the stone is probably natural, but pattern was not easy to see uh, because of the uh, mounting and uh, the conclusions were not uh, typical. There were clouds that kind of could be uh, could be a cloud of pinpoints, uh, natural could be flux, uh, synthetic clouds. So he went to another jeweler. Uh, who has an ID 100 with this instrument from GIA that's similar to EXA, uh, basically checking entry center or absence of present. If it's absent, refer it. So my X also referred it. So based on strange fluorescence and referring and not easy uh, to see clouds, he called it laboratory ground and value maybe $23,000. So I, I don't remember exactly. Uh, quality was not so uh, high. 
Uh, then I, I knew uh, that it's probably natural based on fluorescence, but then I check with the EXA and I see that the uh, line around 4, uh, 496 is typical for nickel uh, S3 center. And of course, I, I, I do guess that if you have hydrogen lines in infrared spectroscopy, this is another advanced test uh, uh, I can do 3107. So definitely I can go to court and prove this stone is natural. I have all support to this. So that's why I see I see three, four tests to come to conclusion. If you do only one or two, you can, of course, sometimes you have only one test to do, but you better do very well that one test uh, and not just make a mistake. Uh, fluorescence or, or, or other tests, uh, you, you're available across tolerance filters or whatever instrument you have. So to conclude, uh, each member of the trade has specific needs. I cannot give you the magic answer. This is the best instrument for you, but uh, I do recommend uh, to take such a webinar as like this one uh, or half day at least, maybe one day workshop uh, to, to learn more. And that way you or read some books. Uh, this is not only mine, there are many other good books uh, on, on the market, uh, but me and Dushan did these two books uh, last three years during Corona, and we said combination of three or more instruments is always the best. And this is a progress I'm doing, and uh, I'm doing a lot uh, in the future. Uh, I'll do online in March, uh, two years or online programs, and these programs are available for relatively inexpensive. Books come with it, and you have an exam at the end. This is very advanced level. I'm not talking about this today, but. Um, People who are much smarter than me, as you see, see doctors from England, Russia, US, Switzerland, Australia, China, they're talking about uh, how to detect uh, diamonds, natural synthetic, and myself, of course. And uh, uh, for those who really want to do practical, I will do in Vancouver on, on January 13. I will do in Tucson show on, on February 3rd. And uh, Dr. Ola Keffert is my uh, uh, big uh, supporter of workshops. So I'm, I'm sure Ray will do more webinars so i strongly recommend to get her to be on your webinar because she's really expert on gemstones and she will do some uh workshop with me and we'll do full day in tucson we did together in a conference in greece and this is something some of you are uh, here who were attending i'm sure you you enjoy it uh, we did a lot of tours and a lot of workshops this is part of the conference and for those who wants to really come and learn more sorry that i'm advertising a little bit but in in two years it's a conference in italy in slovenia a mediterranean but I'm going to other continents with the NCGV, what is Valdez of Australia. I'm doing a big conference in Australia in uh, uh, July 1st in Brisbane. Thank you, Ray, and thank you everybody for coming. And I'm open for questions uh, on this topic or, or something similar to what uh, Duncan was talking. Uh, I think both of us can answer your questions. Okay, I'd, I'd like to jump in here if I may. And that, uh, my first question I'd like to ask you, Branko, is at what price break is it feasible to be bothered to do these testing? Because obviously it's not going to be cheap uh, because of the amount of uh, investment you have to make in technical and, and in time to do the testing. So at what size and value of stone, roughly speaking, would you feel it's feasible to actually go the extra step to make sure yes. it's natural? I mean, uh, what I see in my laboratory and I'm doing testing and appraising, I'm not appraiser, I have another person doing appraising. Uh, it's like... I mean, I see the people using certain uh, instruments, but when they have these unusual results, like a diamond with yellow fluorescence or green, and this instrument uh, give a referral, they would pass it to me. They would pass it, if it's a big company, they would pass even Mele. Uh, then we charge whatever, $30 uh, to just do verbal. But I think it's a question of, of, of integrity of, 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 of appraiser or, or seller to make sure that all diamonds uh, i had one uh, a customer he had a two stones out of uh, 98 the 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 lab grown believe it or not but he want to make sure that he takes the two out and he sell all natural but on other uh, side uh, people some of them uh, who has mostly lab grown and and uh, two or three natural didn't care they said okay call them all laboratory grown i think it depends on, on on the customer, some of these instruments uh, cost only 500 to 600 dollars. So it's not a big investment to start with one instrument uh, and, and training. Uh, I would uh, I would say uh, I've seen uh, usually uh, stones half carat and up for the, for the reports. If it's a smaller stones, they just want verbal, so verbal opinion. Like you you do need to test them and give them verbal opinion. Uh, is it natural or laboratory grown? Please open up your mics. I'd like to have some other questions here to help us learn more.
Hi, I have a question. Okay, please tell us who you are. My name is Sarah Dunn. I'm a third year uh, student at BCU, Birmingham City University in UK, studying gemology and jewelry studies. Um, I was thinking for my, um, my third year research project on black diamonds. Ah, interesting. Um, yeah, and uh, I've got a sample from Congo and I've got a few samples from India. So um, combination of black to pepper and salt diamonds. Yes. So, um, although they're rough and they're kind of octahedron to do octahedron kind of, um, they're, they're very deformed because they're rough crystals. Um, so the thing is that I need to do a lot of analysis with them. I could do some FTIR, RAM, and UV vis uh, with the diamond view, but I'm very restricted because they're black diamonds. Yes. So I can do the luster, that is fine, but because yes. it's tape, I can't do the cross polarized um, test, so that will fail. So what I was asking is like, um, can I have your thoughts about the testing? What can I do? What can yes. I not do? Yes. Um, for this project? This is a good question and interesting uh, topic. Uh, uh, I have to, I mean, I'm not promoting any magazine or something, but I really have to uh, mention very good article on black diamonds uh, published in Australian uh, gemologist just recently uh, this, uh, this, uh, this year. And I learned from that, it's mean it's really good. I mean, why? Because it's really explained difference between uh, natural diamond, uh, carbonado, uh, what is industrial uh, and uh, some other uh, stones. And my experience here, and just, this is an interesting story actually, uh, just a few months ago, I had a 100 carat uh, black diamond coming to the laboratory from, from a new customer who had a report. Uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, it wasn't a, a real report. It was a little bit fake report with address in Switzerland saying it's a black natural diamond and want me to put the value. And of course, uh, I tested, uh, this is one thing you mentioned very well, luster is very important. To it's a very high uh, uh, mirror-like luster uh, uh, that is different from, from, from black diamond and mozonite. Mozonite, uh, they, they grow mozonite quite big in Russia. And this is one test, uh, I wish, you, uh, I wish you, you find a way to measure luster. Uh, it, it, this would be a great project and I'll be happy to, 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 to help you if you want. But, uh, and the other way is specific gravity, of course. Uh, uh, Mozonet has a, a less specific gravity, 3.2, and, and diamond is 352. A very limited test you can do with black diamonds uh, because of uh, that, you cannot uh, pass the light. Uh, unless they have some tra translucency, then maybe you get some spectra and something fluorescent. They're not completely black. But uh, they're very interesting stones to study. And as you know, um, uh, most of the melee diamonds black on the market are, are treated black natural diamonds. They just burn them. And actually, in 2016, I was teaching at University of Birmingham a uh, two days program. And one day was laboratory grown, one day was uh, treated diamonds. And I showed some black diamonds that are completely burned uh, without pressure. This is how they make them. So you can assume that all of them are, are, are treated black under uh, 15 points, of what I know. Very rare, they could be natural. But interesting project. Uh, thank you. And uh, uh, you can email me uh, info at brancogems.com. Anybody who has any questions or, or Ray uh, can pass it to me. Uh, hopefully, if you have any questions, so we can get in touch. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. May, I, may, I, may I add one thing to that? This Duncan here. Yeah. Um, I had a, a parcel of Australian Argyle black diamonds. Oh. And uh, I don't have it anymore, unfortunately. <clears throat> and I, I know where it came from. I know its history. And I ran a magnet through. And uh, about ten percent of them were attracted to a magnet, hmm. uh -huh. which is uh, quite interesting because, of course, uh, normally we would not expect that that result. Yeah, I think uh, this article in Australian Gemology is, is talking about that. And again, uh, I will ask uh, uh, people from Australian Gemology. Uh, they just published one interesting article about conference there. And one person came, uh, uh, Catherine Wyatt, uh, uh, to the conference in Greece. I'll ask if it's okay to uh, forward this article or not, because uh, it's not my article. I, I just have it as, as a magazine. <laughs> so it's uh, Black Diamond's a very interesting um, topic. Yep. Another question? Uh, Chris Mullet again. Uh, I've got a question. I don't know if there's got a short answer or not, because I know really nothing about diamonds. My question is, uh, is there a, a, a big difference or is it easy to describe the difference between a type one and type two diamond? Uh, 
because I don't know one from the other. Yes. Or should uh, I do some research? One way, if I'm now in my laboratory, I'm not. I'm at home. I will show you a little uh, polariscope and a cross polar, but you saw it in the picture, maybe in the first picture. A uh, little polariscope, portable one. I mean, you can use big one like for testing or gems, but it has to be half carat a bigger diamond to, to check it. But the portable one, uh, I mean, you can get for $100 uh, part of the kit or separately. Gemma is selling it. I'm selling it. Many people are selling it. So uh, you can see the pattern is different. Uh, type 1 diamond, generally speaking, uh, has a more intense, more uh, strain. They call it strain cutters uh, and more different colors. Um, Sometimes uh, we, we pub, of, of my best-selling book was really uh, with Dushan Simic, actually. He's, uh, he's a lot of his pictures, of course, most of it. Uh, it's on uh, cross polarized patterns. So you can separate type two. You cannot separate 2A and 2B, but you can say it's type two that is uh, uh, without nitrogen and type one with the nitrogen based on cross polarized filters, natural diamonds. You can use this technique also for, for synthetic. Synthetic are mm -hmm. also uh, most of them type 2A unless they are yellow or ash fish tigron, they are type 1B. Their, their absence of pattern or very, very uh, typical uh, parallel pattern, or sometimes they cross like this. So parallel parallel or crossed. This is a technique, to a cheap technique, talking, talking about $100 investment. If you want a more expensive technique, $25,000 investment, mini, uh, mini uh, infrared spectrometer, uh, or I have 35,000 because I, I have desk model, I use a lot of jade testing here. Uh, so this is a then you can do you can see impurities position in your uh, infrared spectrum but the chip uh, and simple technique is a also if you have something else fluorescence can help this is another topic if you have medium to strong fluorescence in diamond medium strong very strong i know you're not talking about now influence on color talking about meaning as id you are dealing with type 1a diamond cannot be type 2a diamond type 2 with the medium strong very strong blue fluorescence Yes, sometimes could be weak. This different story, but not medium strong and very strong. So this is for essence plus cross polarized filters. You have idea about the type. Actually, I got a stone from Toronto a few weeks ago uh, that uh, nobody in Toronto uh, could not say uh, if it's natural or laboratory grown. Why? Because it was problem. Problem is that we have a high color, high clarity diamonds. D, uh, this one was flawless. Very often they are eternally flawless. We don't have inclusions and they are type D and they're high color. What most of these uh, black instruments will tell you, we call it uh, black box instruments, will refer it, refer it, refer it. What does it help you if you have a two, three carat diamond that you have referral? Nothing. Mm -hmm. So you have to test it for the cross polarized filters. Fluorescence doesn't help too much because no fluorescence. And then you use a spectroscopy. And this is what people are missing uh, that uh, two or three tests. They want only one magic box. Uh, I know dealers would like to have one and invest $5,000. Uh, they can have one and be accurate 95, 96%. These two, three, four percent still there for us, gemologists or, or experts, uh, not only me, there are a few of us who, who can separate this, but mostly in the gem labs. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks very much, Branko. Yeah. Any other questions? I'd like to throw a request out to everybody that's still with us is that we're looking forward to planning, long-term planning for the 2023. And I'm looking for gem topics that you would like to have experts talk to you about. So if you would uh, take a moment to send me an email at the, at the return email, the confirmation email address, and uh, what you would like to see or like to hear about, um, that would be a great help for planning for next year. So until the end of January, thank you all very much for attending. Thank you for your questions, those who've asked them. And thank you speakers for taking the time and effort to put together such uh, a very comprehensive and, and interesting program. So uh, congratulations and kudos to you both. And thank you audience, hope have you, you all have a nice Christmas and do not forget to share with me any ideas you'd like to see and learn more about in the new year. Uh, and with that, I'd like to close the program and wish you all a happy Christmas. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Enjoy it. Thanks for inviting us. Yeah. Thanks for your, your contributions, guys. It was really excellent. Thank you. Thanks. And uh, have a great rest of the day. <laughs>